Thank you to the Tufts University Innovation Lab for Nutrition and the Gerald and Dorothy Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy for inviting me to open this discussion. It is critically important for the United States to focus on building evidence of what works to address hunger and malnutrition. As we all know, having access to nutritious food plays an important role in the development, health, and well being of individuals in all stages of life around the world. The COVID 19 pandemic has had a devastating toll on the health and well being of families around the world, driving millions of people deeper into hunger and poverty. We know in the United States that one in eight Americans and one in six American children will experience food insecurity in 2021. Globally, we know that number is even more dire, as high as one in three. And we know that greater challenges remain ahead with climate change already affecting food security through increasing temperatures, changing pre precipitation patterns, and bringing more frequent and more extreme storms. Our academic community has been critical to helping collect and relay the evidence. USAID's support of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab and Tufts University's Innovation Lab for Nutrition and Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy have been instrumental translating such evidence into impactful programs and policies on the ground. Through your work, we can meet the goal of the Feed the Future initiative and reduce global hunger, malnutrition, and poverty by harnessing American science, technology, and innovation. Tufts has been a leader on nutrition issues for decades, and you continue to inspire and lead not only the United States, but the whole world in solving this problem. Thank you all so much for everything that you do. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, last event uh, of the 10 year legacy event of the Nutrition Innovation Lab in this panel discussion between USAID, the government of Nepal, the Nutrition Innovation Lab, and uh, uh, Governor McVorn, uh, Representative McVorn, sorry, giving us his remark. Uh, this event will be introduced by or moderated by our colleague from MCC, Aisha House. Aisha House is the Vice President for MCC Department Congressional and Public Affairs, where she oversees planning, implementation, and overseeing of domestic international communication, media relation event, and digital outreach strategies, as well as strengthen MCC relationship with Congress, NGOs, businesses, and the US public. Ms. House has a distinguished career in the US government in both the executive and the legislative branch. Prior to joining MCC, Ms. House served as the Senior Advisor for Feed the Future Interagency Coordinator at USAID, where she worked to advance US government, government's global food security efforts. Ms. House <clears throat> also advanced USAID diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda, specifically as a founding member of the Donald Payne Fellowship Program and supported various congressional efforts. Ms. House received a master's degree in political management from George Washington University and two bachelors of arts from Florida State University in political science and interdisciplinary social science. Uh, Ms. House, over to you. All right, thanks Ahmed. I really appreciate it. And I'm so happy to be back amongst the Feed the Future family. MCC is obviously a member of the interagency, but it's always good to kind of come home to my USAID colleagues um, and frankly, to be surrounded by other people who are fervent champions of food security and, and all the things that come with that. And so i um, really, really happy to be here today. And I'm really happy to be a part of this panel, which will be fantastic as we know. Um, we have a stellar group of people here who are going to be talking about the importance of this make or break year in nutrition. Um, and so I wanted to just kick it off by giving a short kind of snapshot bio of each of them. Um, as you all know, Congressman McGovern is one of our biggest champions as it relates to not just nutrition and food security, but just agriculture at large and supporting our research and agriculture needs. So um, Congressman McGovern is representing Massachusetts second district, um, which was his hometown of Worcester. 
Um, and, you know, the congressman has been a longtime champion for us. He's been a, the chairman of the Rules Committee. He's been on and leading the Congressional Hunger Caucus for years. I could say, honestly, if I know at least over a decade. And so, Congressman, thank you so much for being here, especially in your role as a senior member of the House Agriculture Committee and just as an outspoken advocate for nutrition, you know, full stop. So thank you for being here. Uh, I, uh, I'll also just chime in and talk about some of our other champions here today. We've got Rob Bertram, who everyone knows um, and everyone loves. Rob is the chief scientist at USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where he serves as the senior advisor on agriculture and nutrition and the implementation of the Global Food Security Act, which we all fought very hard to pass. Um, and in his role, Rob is also leading all of the all of USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research technology and the implementation of um, the global the U.S. government's global hunger um, strategy. So that is that is Rob. And there's so much more I could say, but um, I do want to also mention that when it comes to Feed the Future and the um, the Feed the Future Innovation Labs, no better person knows all of the labs all of the people in the labs and all of the work that's coming out of the labs than Rob. So Rob, thank you so much again for being here today. Um, I also go over to um, our, our fearless leader, Sean Baker, who's been the champion and chief nutritionist for USAID at large, not just within the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. We all know that nutrition takes a integrated approach and so it's great to have Sean at USAID working not only on how to advance nutrition at large across the different bureaus, but also really, really championing how we make sure that nutrition is integrated into all of the programmatic work. So um, Sean has been at USAID since, Sean, how long have you been at USAID? I apologize, since 27, 2018? Uh, 19 months. <laughs> February 20. 2020. Since 2020. Um, and prior to coming to USA, Sean was working and championing nutrition at not just uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but also as the regional director for Africa at Helen Keller. Um, today, we are also honored to have Dr. Shabani Ghosh, a who is a research associate professor, excuse me, professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Um, and Dr. Gosh has been leading on the Feed the Future Lab, Innovation Lab for Nutrition. Um, she has a, an enormous amount of experience working in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And her research work has largely been in agriculture and improving nutrition um, while also ensuring health and assessing the diets and non-diet detriments of nutritional status of infants and young children. So thank you, Dr. Gosh, for being here today. Um, we've got two more panelists to introduce, and that's the one is Dr. Webb, who is the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Nutrition. Um, Dr. Webb is the Alexander McFarlane Professor of Nutrition at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Um, and he's the principal investigator of USAID's Food Aid Quality Review Project. So until 2005, Professor Webb was the chief of nutrition at the United Nations World Food Program. And he has served on numerous task, for task forces and global advisory panels in his current, uh, in, and is currently the senior advisor to the high level global panel on agriculture and food systems for nutrition. And then finally, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Karan Rupekti. I apologize, Dr. Karan. Um, Dr. Karan is a senior level government officer and the joint secretary currently working as a division chief of good governance at social development division at the National Planning Commission in the government of Nepal. And in addition, he is scaling up nutrition um, where the Sun Movement County, excuse me, country coordinator of Nepal and an executive committee member of the Global Sun Movement, taking lead for Central and South Asia. So in this role, um, Dr. Karan is also the Division Chief of Good Governance and Social Development at the Division of the NPC, where he is currently leading um, the Concern Division and Section, as well as the Nutrition National Nutrition Food Security Secretariat. So uh, we have a stellar group, like I mentioned, and we've got a ton of things to talk about and go through. But to get us started, I wanted to just give um, Congressman McGovern 
a moment to say a few words and then to maybe answer a key question. So with that, um, Mr. Congressman McGovern, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Aisha, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, and please let me thank uh, uh, USAID and the Tufts University Freeman School of Nutrition and Science and Policy for the honor of joining you at this final session of your two-day review of the past decade's work on nutrition uh, and food security. Uh, it's hard for me to fully grasp that you have all been looking back over a decade's or, uh, worth of work and then taking a serious look at uh, where we all need to go next. So uh, let, me, let me start with a couple of stories. You know, ever since I was first elected to Congress, I've been interested in trying to end hunger here at home and around the world. Hunger is a simple word, but it's a complex reality. No one knows that better than all of you. Uh, and how to end it, to eliminate it, is much more than getting food on the table. Uh, it's why I set out to create and establish the George McGovern Robert Dole International Food for Education and Child Nutrition Program. How do you help make individuals, families, communities, nations, regions food secure? How do you ensure that people have access to affordable, nutritious food so that they are able, uh, so that they are healthy in body, mind, and spirit? How do you support small farmers so they can produce nutritious food, and make it a decent living doing so? How do you, how do we create agriculture that keeps our land and water as healthy as our, as the children and families that we hope to feed? You know, I travel to many parts of the world and I've seen marvelous development projects, many funded by USAID that promote food security and help lift whole communities out of poverty. I've watched malnourished children literally brought back to life with specialized foods packed with just the nutrients they need to survive and then to thrive. But I also saw lots of times uh, US agencies that uh, how, I've also seen that how lots of times US agencies had no idea what each other were doing or, or worse, were working across purposes and undermining progress. In May of 2008, the GAO came out with a report called International Food Security. It looked at how we, the U.S., international donors, host nations, were going, uh, were going to fail in our efforts to cut hunger in half in sub-Saharan Africa. The primary recommendation of that report was that the U.S. government needed to develop an integrated government-wide strategy if we were going to ever tackle food insecurity effectively. I remember sitting in a small conference room in the Rayburn House office building with Tom uh, Melito of the GAO. It was Tom, me, my Republican colleague, uh, Congressman, uh, Congressman Joanne Emerson of Missouri, and our respective staff. We I remember talking for nearly two hours about what needed to be done. That conversation changed me. Uh, I knew where I was going to focus my energies and how I wanted to change our traditional approach towards global hunger and food security. From that day forward, the words whole of government, resilience, sustain, sustainable, and nutrition became uh, staples in my vocabulary. And then Barack Obama was elected president of the United States and he nominated Hillary Clinton as his first secretary of state. I asked to see Hillary be even before she was confirmed. I'm sure she thought I was gonna ask her to create peace on earth. And if I thought that uh, that could be done in four years, I, I might've asked her to do that. But I, I sat down with her uh, with just two very concrete ideas. And the top one was for her to create a government-wide integrated strategy on how to advance global food security, nutrition, and agriculture. I think it caught her imagination. I mean, she, I'm just, you know, I think maybe she already was, I knew this anyway. But, um, and as many participating in this two-day conference, I think, uh, no, after many, many meetings, consultations, listening sessions, review of research and studies, ultimately Feed the Future was launched. And one of the most important components of Feed the Future has been its commitment to rigorous research, innovation, study, and evaluation. Whole of government doesn't just mean the State Department, USDA, Treasury, USTR, and the Millennium Challenge Corporation. It means engagement of our universities, our innovators, our scientists, our field researchers, our private sector, and more importantly, the farmers, teachers, extension officers, local and regional markets, health experts, child development experts, and the whole array of expertise here in, uh, in our host countries. And it means we constantly evaluate, evaluate, evaluate what's working, why, what's not working, why, what needs to change, who else needs to be included. 
And that's the incredible collaborative role that the nutrition and innovation labs play. You help strengthen institutions and build capacity on the ground with host countries. You help nurture the next generation of academics, researchers, and practitioners committed to advancing nutrition and food security in their own countries. You keep Feed the Future focused on how to improve nutrition throughout the entire production and food chain. And each of you know far better than I what the successes and the challenges of the last 10 years have been in integrating nutrition into every aspect of our agriculture and food security programs. Most of what I know about nutrition, I've learned from you individually and collectively. But each of us also knows that the COVID-19 pandemic was a wake-up call of the harshest kind. It showed us the fra fra uh, uh, fragility of the progress we have achieved, and it exposed the vulnerability of our local, national, and international food systems. I'm counting on you not just to tell me uh, that we have to build back better. I'm counting on you to tell me how we do that in the best ways possible, ways that help the greatest number of people and reduce the inequalities between the haves and the have nots. We are witnessing the folly of waiting too long, putting off the hard decisions, avoiding the obvious with a world suffering from flood and fire, drought and pests. We can't let that happen in the field of nutrition and food security. We need to make sure that the next decade of solutions that we propose will strengthen resilience and be sustainable in, the, in a rapidly changing uh, landscape, global landscape. And we need to see numbers of people suffering from hunger and food insecurity drop year after year after year. I wanna see the United States walk into the December Nutrition for Growth Summit in Tokyo with really with concrete proposals and real commitments, the kind that demonstrate leadership and spark the imagination and galvanize global action. And if we can do that, then perhaps we are moving closer to creating a world where no child, no mother or father, no family, no farmer, no worker, where no one goes to bed hungry and fearful of the morning. So I'm so grateful for the uh, proud uh, and, and uh, for the proud, uh, and I'm so grateful and I'm incredibly proud of, of the work of Feed the Future and the Innovation Lab for Nutrition. I'm grateful for all the work that each of you does to advance nutrition and food security here in the United States and around the world. Uh, and, you know, I applaud you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Congressman McGovern. And uh, thank you again, too, for just being this longtime champion, not only for uh, nutrition, but also food security at large. Um, and I did want to ask you a question, if I might, before we turn it over to our uh, other panelists. Um, in a space where we all know that nutrition as well as development takes time. It takes time to see results and it takes time to be able to see the true gains from, um, from our work and our investments. What are your thoughts and what has been the discussion on the Hill with regard to the Global Food Security Act and it being an actual uh, legislative vehicle that potentially does not have an end date or an authorization date in order to make sure that we can continue to do the work without having fear of um, our authorization actually expiring. Well, clearly that is what our goal is, right? And um, and I would just say to everybody here, um, and I say this when I see you individually or sometimes collectively, I, I want you to brag more about what you're doing um, because I think we have to go beyond just targeting those members who are on key committees. I think we need to broaden the awareness of how important these programs are. Um, you know, I mean, you know, the, these programs are not just about preventing hunger and, um, and, 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 and helping ch children develop into healthy adults. I mean, these are about national security. Uh, these are about the futures of, you know, a number of countries around the world that are, that are struggling. And I just, and I, um, you know, I, uh, I had, um, I had hoped after, uh, well, you know, at one point, this was uh, before we, when Obama was president, before we lost control of the House, I, w I wanted Nancy Pelosi, a speaker, to kind of bring all the different chairs of every single committee together and then get a briefing by, you know, Feed the Future and, um, and, and you know, and, and a number of people on this call so that people could better understand and make the connections. I mean, and, and so, um, look, I am going to be wind at your back to get to that. Um, this is incredibly important work, um, and um, but I, I, I got to find ways to 
to brag about you more uh, because um, and and to and to make sure that we are sharing the results uh, and the research that you were doing with everybody because I think it's very very powerful uh, and I think that could uh, ultimately make a difference um, to getting to where you want to go. Well, thank you for that, and that is one invitation I know none of us will pass up if you are able to bring those people together. Um, and uh, especially given we now have uh, Feed the Future Week every September, where we also celebrate our innovation labs, um, we would love to continue to work with you. And if we can create that opportunity, we certainly will. So thank we'll, you for that. We'll work together. Um, thank you. All right, great. Well, so with that, let me, uh, let me just turn it over to kind of get some background and some history going here, because I know we all know about the success of Feed the Future and uh, the success of the Nutrition Innovation Lab. Um, I and mean, I think that it would be great if Rob, uh, or excuse me, Dr. Bertram, if you could talk a little bit about how successful um, this Innovation Lab in particular was, um, particularly as it relates to research, meeting rigor, then adding that policy transformation to really deliver results. So looking back 10 years later, can you talk about some of the key lessons that we've learned from this uh, innovation lab in particular? Well, thanks so much, Aisha. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I just have to say that was so stirring listening to Congressman McGovern right now. And you know, he started in 2008, which was a wake up call to the world, the food, food price crisis. Uh, and, and I wanna say, that that was the same year as the financial crisis. So we could have lost the thread. We could have got sidetracked because of people like Congressman McGovern, that didn't happen. And, and the, the rest has been history, so to speak. And the Nutrition Innovation Lab has, has been a thread, one of the main, the warp of this fabric that we've created. Um, so I wanna just say that when food and agriculture came back, in Feed the Future it was so exciting. President Obama and his inaugural speech, uh, the G7 commitments, uh, it, was it wasn't the same because nutrition was right there. And pretty soon it became clear that we were on the hook for two metrics. One was reduction in poverty, which we you know, had a lot of evidence on. The other was reduction in child stunting. And as Aisha just said, both of those things, those are real development objectives that take time. And I have to tell you, as an agriculturalist, I was completely daunted and said so in many situations, like, how are we going to do this? And fortunately, and I want to call out Cheryl Frederick and Josette Lewis for having had the foresight to set up, stand up a new university-led nutrition program that became the Nutrition Innovation Lab. So we had, and we had a whole new set of partners in our work, and we had the ability to engage in nutrition in a way that we wouldn't have had just a few years earlier. And that was so critical because we saw, for example, the, uh, the Lancet work came out that said that even if we did everything right, nutrition specific interventions, we could only reduce stunting by 20%. And, and so it, these other things that are enshrined in our multi-sectoral nutrition strategy, and which Sean and others can say more about, is our, it, we needed all these things to come together. And so we were the food piece, the income piece. And the question was, how do we make that pay off in nutrition? And that's where the lab was fantastic. Uh, the, the issues of women's empowerment emerged, the uh, role of markets emerged, uh, we saw, we, we learned about what nutrition sensitive agriculture really is and maybe what some of its limitations are. And I want to just call out another thing as an agriculturalist. We recently heard from the lab that one of the things, three things that correlate with stunting from agriculture, planting in rows, effort, intention, trellising, diversification into more nutritious, higher value crops, mechanization, capitalization investment. So this was is so exciting to people like me who have been saying, you know, what can we do to really make those goals? So I think now Congressman said, you know, we've had a second shock with, with uh, 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 the COVID. And I think now what do we are, we're, it's another wake up call. And I'm really counting on this, all the work that we're gonna be talking about today to help us launch a new reaction and response to that. And the last point is we succeeded. 
because of the work of the lab and, and their influence across our whole portfolio, we drove down stunting rates faster than we drove down poverty rates. And that's incredibly important. Thanks. That's great, Rob. Thank you so much. And it's true that the collaborative work of this innovation lab is just really, uh, it's stellar and it's something for everyone to model. Sean, I'm curious from your perspective, when, when we're making nutrition central to how one build innovation lab of today and the future, what is the key ingredient to ensure success across the food system itself? Yeah, thanks, Aisha. And I, I wanted to echo what Robert said. I mean, listening to Senator Markey's remarks and then uh, Representative McGovern's, I almost had tears in my eyes because, you know, somebody worked in public health and nutrition for 40 years. This is the leadership we need. You know, I adore all of our, my technical colleagues, but if we do not have the wind in our sails from our political leadership, we can do very little. Um, I want to step back just to um, set the stage a bit of where we're standing in terms of what the food system is currently delivering globally in terms of nutritious food. If you look across low and middle income countries, for that critical period when breast milk is not enough from six to 23 months, and you need to make sure you're getting good nutritious food into kids' bellies, less than 18% of these infants and young kids are getting a, a minimal acceptable diet. And so to me, this is to me the, the prime directive that we need to make sure it's that political will to understand, yes, we need the food system to deliver on many things, but its prime directive has to be able to deliver safe, affordable, nutritious food. And the innovation labs, I think, have two fundamental roles to play here. What is the innovation understanding? What are the obstacles to doing that? So we can actually, as we transform food systems, have the innovations needed to deliver on that requirement for nutritious foods, particularly for mothers and children. But then also we understand that the food system is being called on to do other things. Make sure we're limiting our environmental impact, make sure we're delivering jobs, make sure we're as equitable as possible, which of course is directly linked to nutritional outcomes. But we need that evidence base of also then how do we work with partner governments and stakeholders hand in hand so they can make these evidence-based trade-off discussions. So at the bottom line, I think it's two magical ingredients, if you will, Aisha. It's really elevating the understanding that a food system that does not deliver safe, nutritious food is not delivering on its prime objective. And this is difficult we need to make sure we're using the best evidence possible to, to guide our policies, make these trade-offs, and adjust as we go forward. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. And, and I think that's absolutely right. I think one thing that we can all agree on is that nutrition is a very complex, you know, a complex challenge. And therefore, with such a complex challenge, there is no one silver bullet or one solution or answer to make, uh, to, to trying to, to solve it. Um, so I, I'd, I'd love to ask to my to colleagues at the, uh, at the Innovation Lab itself at Tufts, um, two questions really, and, and feel free to take them on however, in whatever order you choose, but talking a little bit more about the lessons learned from the lab, when you get into the weeds of um, this lab successes, what are like the key three nutrition takeaways for researchers and for government officials like Congressman McGovern and others to really appreciate and to understand? Um, and then I'd love, so lessons learned would be one focus that we would love to hear more about. And then in general, let's talk a little bit about diversity. Um, diversity has a lot of different layers to it. Um, and especially in nutrition, diversity lends itself to both diet as well as livelihoods. So can you talk a little bit about what did this innovation lab get right and what were some of the challenges kind of left? Thank you, Aisha. Um, a great and complex question. <laughs> Let me start yeah. by echoing the, you know, the, our, my thanks for the, the humbling remarks by both Senator Markey and Rep Representative McGovern. Um, 
let me play off Sean's you know, insightful, as always, uh, comments about the, the focus, keeping a laser-like focus on safe, nutritious diets uh, for everyone, everyone, uh, not, not just non-Irish uh, kids. Uh, some of the things that we have discovered on, let's take safe, um, poor people aren't just willing and able to eat just anything. They are concerned about food safety just as, as we are. And so food grown in the tropics, especially the nutritious foods, which are often perishable, more perishable uh, and take longer to get to market and cost more effort and time to, to produce, uh, that, that's nutrient rich foods, whether it's dairy or legumes or fruits and vegetables. Um, they are concerned about how they are produced and, you know, do they carry uh, contaminants uh, from overuse of chemicals? Do they carry foodborne diseases? Uh, in this world of COVID, you know, where we, we're seeing zoonotic disease spill over, there is a real concern in these countries, the countries in which we work, um, that uh, we now have to not just worry about enough food uh, or even the right food, but it's got to be safe. It's got to be safe food as well. Uh, and so we've we've done a lot of work uh, by ensure by capturing some of the, those concerns among uh, small farmers, uh, consumers in the market marketplace. Um, what do what do we get right? I think one of the things, and I will then pass over to my uh, colleague uh, Dr. Ghosh. I think one thing we got right was to to focus on nutrition very very holistically uh, as, as something that has uh, many different drivers and many different manifestations, right? We weren't looking at it through a narrow lens. And we ensure, we tried to ensure that we didn't just, for example, look at how effective was a program generating more food or improving the quality of water or uh, bringing education. Yes, we did that. We wanted to look at that. What is adoptable? What, what things do people actually want in these, in these communities? But we allied that, what's going on around outside of an individual child with what's going on inside that individual child. So we allied economic and agricultural sciences with the biological sciences that, and really pushed the boundaries in understanding uh, gut function, enter enteric dysfunction, and uh, aflatoxin contamination, what that does for on growth and, and birth outcomes, even cognitive outcomes, so child development uh, uh, over time. All of this using very, very rigorous methods. And I think it's combining understanding what matters to a public health or a medical uh, audience with what matters to a minister of finance or a minister of agriculture or bringing those two dimensions together so that everyone can understand how one can achieve improved nutrition and what are the benefits of this, I think has been part of, of the success. Um, but let me ask uh, Dr. Ghosh maybe to, to chime in on top of that. Yeah, um, thank you, Patrick, um, and, and thank you, Aisha, for some really, really critically important questions here. Um, my experience in the past 10 years uh, with the lab has been, firstly, um, you know, when you are working in the space that we are working in, being adaptive and being dynamic is critical. Um, what we have been successful in is generating very credible, credible and rigorous evidence, but we've also been very adaptive and dynamic. Um, the work that uh, Patrick made mention to with mycotoxins and gut health was something that evolved from our understanding of the need for this information and the need for data around food safety. Um, and this wasn't in the first iteration of our innovation lab, but as soon as we realized that this is an important area of research, we adapted our, um, our strategy, our research strategy. The second thing I'd like to say is that um, policy, uh, we, we are really, really, really uh, focused on doing research that is policy relevant, but it's also very critical for the research to be innovative. So that's, that's, that's a tricky combination to get. You wanna, be, you, you wanna have both ends, uh, if you will. Um, and that's something that I think we were really successful in. Uh, for instance, if you all have heard uh, the session that happened earlier on innovative metrics, 
uh, Giacomo Zanello, who's one of our colleagues and researchers out in the UK, utilized existing techniques of energy expenditure measurement, um, techniques that we've been using over the years um, in nutrition, um, in understanding the gendered nature of labor allocation in rural areas of Ghana, Nepal, and India. Tremendous policy implications of that work, particularly around um, targeting agricultural interventions when it when within the context of gender. And I'll make one last point, Aisha, is that we were very, um, we, we have a fantastic group of local partners and researchers who are extremely bought in to, the, uh, to our paradigm, which is we really need to push research and capacity building to drive change uh, in the specific context we're working in. So uh, all, those are really the three major points I'd like to make uh, around the lessons learned and the key takeaways. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. And I think uh, I just wanna make sure that folks do know that I, obviously this is a conversation. So we do wanna get that feedback from the audience. So if you do have questions, please feel free to um, enter them into the chat. Um, I wanna make sure that we um, acknowledge them. And I know that there is a question actually that's coming in from the chat now with regard to kind of frankly government engagement and how do you make a, a realistic kind of nutrition map for a country that can frankly be scaled. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Kieran to talk a little bit about not only from the Nepali perspective, how you all um, took some of the findings from the actual innovation lab itself and integrated them into your overall plans, but also too, if you could talk a little bit about just in general, kind of the policy transformation at large when it came to uh, Nepal and how you've integrated that into your lessons learned and what, what some of the work is that you're doing now. So over to you, Dr. Karen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this wonderful opportunity and being with you um, in this August um, gathering. Uh, actually, let me start uh, that uh, the government of Nepal is very much pleased to be a part of this, you know, uh, for the Future Innovation Lab. Um, actually, Nepal is one of the uh, most benefited country, you know, a lot of research that have been done uh, in the context of Nepal and, and uh, the findings have largely been used, uh, especially in the framing of, of uh, nutrition uh, policies, plan and programs. Um, so, uh, so especially I would like to, you know, refer here, multi-sector nutrition plan first and second. The first was uh, implemented from 2013 to 2018, and then after we are implementing multi-sector nutrition plan second, and uh, then after uh, we have formulated 15 uh, uh, five-year periodic plan and and all the you know related strategies, um, um, and more than that, at the moment we are you know carrying out fill the nutrient gap analysis with the help of World Food Program and. Let me, you know, share with you uh, the important fact that uh, such kind of, you know, cost of the diet study was already done by um, um, uh, Innovation Lab. And on the basis of that, we are carrying out uh, for the future, you know, sorry, we are carrying out um, fill the nutrient gap analysis. And not only that, um, so some of the findings of uh, the research has been largely been uh, used, that is going to be used for uh, UN Food System Summit that is going to be held uh, uh, after a few days' time. So in a, in a North Cell, actually, a lot of transformation um, uh, we have, you know, uh, realized, especially policy transformations. And um, I won't be saying that exclusively, it's only because of, um, uh, you know, innovation labs, research, but uh, that has triggered us to, you know, change ourselves, especially um, uh, most of the intervention used to be there in silo, you know, agriculture policy, not talking about nutrition and health uh, is, you know, was conducting its intervention and activities um, in isolation. But one of the greatest achievement, um, to my understanding, policy transformation is uh, formulation and execution of multi-sector nutrition plan, uh, the first and second. Actually, uh, we have got a lot of insight from the findings of um, uh, innovation lab. And um, 
let me uh, further clarify that we have widened the scope of multi-sector nutrition plan uh, from first to sec second. Actually, in the second, we have emphasized too much on not only nutrition specific intervention, but also nutrition sensitive intervention. For example, uh, health, um, ag agriculture, food safety, was management, and so on and so forth. And not only that, we have focused on micronutrient, you know, uh, a triple burden of, you know, um, uh, malnutrition. Uh, so um, another achievement in this regard is agriculture development strategy from 2015 to 2035, which has also emphasized on uh, the nutrition, which was not there in the first phase of such a strategy. Um, so health sector nutrition uh, strategy also broadened its scope, focusing on life cycle approach um, um, and with give, giving emphasis on, uh, you know, golden thousand days. Um, and, um, you know, more than that, uh, Nepal has uh, been able to project itself in international, you know, arena as well. Um, and now it's active member of uh, scaling up nutrition movement, uh, global movement. And more than that, um, uh, there are a number of act policies and plans. Um, uh, they are related to food security and nutrition. Uh, and most importantly, uh, the constitution of Nepal, federal constitution uh, of Nepal uh, guarantees Food Sovereignty Act uh, as the right to all its citizens, uh, sovereignty as a right to all its citizens. And most importantly, um, in order to operationalize the constitutional provision, the right to food and sovereignty act 2018 is enacted. So all these, you know, um, uh, the provisions at the moment, uh, I would say that has been largely you know, motivated with our involvement with uh, Fit the Future Innovation Lab. Uh, over to you, Aisha, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and, and yes, thank you just to, in general to the, to the people of Nepal and to the success that it's had with regard to some of the, the results and the policy transformation that's still happening. Um, curious though, in general, and would love to hear more from the folks across the panel, what does it mean to have a nutrition map or a, a mapping of a country when it comes to nutrition? And how do we potentially overlay so many of this, these conflict, COVID, climate, when it comes to trying to map out, you know, how do we successfully integrate nutrition across not just, you know, diverse geographies, but really frankly, diverse, you know, things that are impacting those different communities? That's open to anyone. Go, Sean. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start out because it's actually one of my favorite points. And of course, I think the, the, the common narrative here, of course, is evidence. But to my mind, one of the unintended negative consequences of multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder action is this perception that everybody needs to do everything everywhere. And that is exactly what we want to avoid. It's okay, in a given situation, and it, you know, national, subnational, what are the specific problems? What are the solution sets? And what sectors do you at the table? There are going to be certain things in health, certain some things in agriculture, certain things in social protection define a few key priorities for those sectors and actors, not everything, and then drive those to good implementation and scale at a level of fidelity. Not everybody needs to do everything. It's like you're, you need to have a few big brains like Dr. Karenz at the helm who are orchestrating. But I think of nutrition as an opera where the the conductor in the pit is keeping all the parts moving, but you're not asking everybody to do every piece of it, right? And to, 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 do, to map that out, this is where the evidence comes into play of understanding what's the problem in different settings, what are gonna be some solutions that are gonna attack that problem, and how do we measure the performance and of course, course correct. And what you want to avoid, as much as I love Christmas trees, is just this kitchen sink approach where you're actually scattered and nobody gets anything done. And that's hard. And the only way you can broker that is having robust evidence. 
Absolutely. Dr. Webb and then Dr. Ghosh. So I love mapping since I'm a geographer by, by training, but uh, I agree with um, Sean, of course. But I would just add that mapping relation, relating to nutrition, uh, in, especially in countries that are federated, like Nepal, like India, like Ghana, like Ethiopia, and so on, uh, what needs to be understood is not just the problem, but the capacities and the capability constraints uh, that play out differently in different places, right? Not necessarily through any fault of their own, but we have to identify where more can be done to achieve traction, uh, where re financial resources, human resources, institutional resources, technical resources, which of these matter most in different contexts and how can we deliver those? And I would just add one thing that we've really emphasized through these 10 years, is research not just for its own sake, even, even for the sake of supporting policy as Dr. Kieran just uh, ably laid out, but also as a, as a vehicle for building capacity for countries to manage their own resources, their own research and identify those weaknesses uh, themselves, right? It's not for us to determine that. So engaging in rig, I think one of the lessons I've learned is that there's no trade-off. You can conduct complex, rigorous, impactful research while building human and institutional capacity at the same time uh, and doing it consciously, not as, a, as a, an unconscious byproduct. And I think that makes everything much more sustainable in the long run. Thanks. Absolutely. Dr. Ghosh? Yes, I think Rob, Rob was... Uh also had his hand up so I was gonna uh, let Rob close us out uh, okay all right that's okay <laughs> um so I think yeah I think um Sean and Patrick have made a lot of the points and I just wanted to add coordination is going to be very critical it's not about working multi-sectorally it's working correctly within your sectors and coordinating across sectors I think that's the key ingredient um, and I think Eileen Kennedy has done some of that work in Ethiopia and some of the research that has been published on Ethiopia um, within the context of an, two other USA projects, not the Innovation Lab, though we have a great collaboration with them. Um, but I just wanted to put a little anecdote in here with respect to sort of this, the multi-sectoral nature of nutrition from a very micro level, we're just getting information and data from some qualitative assessments conduct, being conducted in Northern Uganda. Again, this is another USAID project. And what we are seeing is that the nutrition at the household level is not just an issue of the messages of a healthy diet. It's about the dynamics in the household. So the gender dynamics and the ability of the husband and wife to be able to have a good relationship, for instance, seems to matter. And I know this is sort of out of context because we are talking very macro level issues here, but I just wanted to illustrate this with a micro level example that for, for us to actually achieve gains in nutrition, we have to get have gains in every other sector, including within the context of gender um, and gender-based uh, issues. So that's really just the point that I wanted to make and I'll hand it back to you, Aisha. Thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing gender into this conversation because it is an important point and it definitely needed to be raised. So, um, Rob, did you want to close out this question in particular on, on mapping? Because I think we've sure, got some really good the future tips hat on. Put my Feed the Future hat on, I should Great. do that. I think many people here know that we work in what are called zones of influence, which we jointly determine with our country partners, uh, like Nepal. And a um, couple of things. One is the issue of subnational variation that, that Patrick referred to. We, we see countries that are very diverse in terms of their burdens of undernutrition, Ghana, for example. Um, and then what I would say is um, what we did in the future was we mapped extreme poverty, child stunt, high rates of child stunting, and potential for agricultural growth and food systems growth to contribute to solutions. And what we found is that those, those things converged in other words, the strong, the big population densities of stunted children, of very poor people are in these rural areas. Now, the other convergent found thing that we found is that uh, these same maps mapped to vitamin A deficiency, 
to iron deficiency, anemia. So it, we, and the, the lab has helped us see, and I think the food systems approach, I mean, one of the things in it that we wanna do is, is as, as Sean said, make those more nutritious foods more available. Final thing is we don't have to talk about it now, but maybe others can come back to the urban linkage piece, because I think that's a very important aspect of making this all work. Thanks. No, it's an excellent point. And actually there, there is um, a little chatter in the, in the chat with regard to um, not just these interventions and making things bespoke to the actual places where we're working, but also to like really being serious about the issue of food safety and taking it on as an integrated a, a part of what, not only what are we um, eating, but how are we keeping that food safe? And then how are we creating a livelihood from it? by helping to really provide the, the inputs for people to keep the food safe and sell them. So can we talk a little bit about food safety for a second, just to make sure that we give it its ju just due. Um, I'd, I'd offer to the panel at large, um, what, what have we learned in general from this innovation lab as it relates to food safety? And what are some of the challenges we see on the horizon with regard to fully integrating food safety um, in this COVID environment? Dr. Ghosh? Yeah, thank you. I just thought I should just jump in here and give illustrate with some examples. Um, so I, again, as I said, you know, the food safety piece in our uh, in our strategy came up based on what we were seeing in countries we were working in. Where yes, of course, the issue of nutrition is is really right in front and center, but the issue is also safety of the food, the nutritious food itself. Um, and and so I think the the first thing was uh, the we have two specific examples. One is where we, we have done extensive research on assessing aflatoxins and mycotoxins um, in both Nepal and Uganda and how the uh, presence of aflatoxins and mycotoxins affect infant and young child growth and development. Um, and one of the critical things that we, what I'd like to highlight here is that there are, while both uh, Nepalese and Ugandan women were exposed to mycotoxins, the source of exposure is very different. And this sort of speaks to the bespoke nature of interventions. In Uganda, it was primarily household production and storage and processing practices. Whereas in Nepal, particularly in the area we were in, it had a lot to do with the market. So in uh, Joanna Andrews Trevino, who is a AAAS fellow now with USAID, highlighted that in her presentation today, that in fact, you're going to have to be very clear on how, what kind of intervention you're doing, but also what context you're doing that intervention in. So, and I, I think Aisha, you've mentioned that there are people in the chat box who are saying that con country contextualization or local contextualization is very, very critical. And that's what we, we are seeing in our research um, um, around food safety. Absolutely. Oh, great. Dr. Webb and then Rob. Well, I, I'll just build on that just very briefly. Uh, as another example of, of um, the science influencing policy in Nepal is a good, great example where the work was undertaken in very close collaboration, not just with local universities, but also local health um, professionals, district health officers and so on, as well as medical people from Ministry of Health, um, which gave greater ownership and credibility of, of, the, uh, of the findings very, very quickly. And that led through these, these studies to us, uh, the Innovation Lab being asked to support the early uh, discussions around a development of a multi-sector um, mycotoxin strategy, right? A, a, a strategy for the country to start cleaning up the food system, right? Understanding that it's not just a problem on the field or even in the home, but it is a market-based uh, issue. And um, that, those discussions continued, right? So that, that's feeding directly into uh, policy development. In Bangladesh, uh, where we've also uh, looked very more, ex more in more detail at consumer concerns, um, it's, it, 
education, interestingly, increases concern. It, 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 there's uh, something there where the more educated, actually, the more the higher income, perhaps you have, even in rural areas. Uh, Rob asked, how, "What's the link with urban areas?" Uh, is uh, there's there's growing understanding and acknowledgement of food safety problems um, through the various media and so on, and that is expressed literally to the stall stall holders in in marketplaces in in rural Nepal. But the positive side here is that the more people become aware and the more urban consumers demand food safety, which they do uh, from their food system, then the more that, need, that needs to be facilitated back upstream through the market to the areas where the food is produced. So there's a, there's a lot of scope for cleaning up the food system um, by working along the value chains of the key products. Over. Rob? Thanks, Aisha. And Patrick basically teed up what I was going to say, I'll, but I'll say a bit more. Sean and I spend a lot of time talking to our colleagues and partners about how we can make high quality, nutritious foods more available and affordable. And these, of course, the animal source foods, the fish, the eggs, the poultry, many dairy. This is uh, fruits and vegetables. And the, and the lab has done great work in the space around hygiene and hygienic environments, which is actually reflected in our, our uh, results framework. But these same value chains uh, and production systems, they're very knowledge intensive. They have, it's much tougher to produce vegetables than it is to grow corn. And, and so there's a lot packed in there and a lot of it has a bearing on food safety. The key is to link the food safety gains with the value gains, which comes back to Patrick's point about people and the market demanding the quality in a way that actually ends up with producers making more money and doing better. So this is a huge convergence of our poverty objectives and our nutrition objectives coming together and really meeting the needs and improving the diets of, of people across, but in both urban and rural settings. Great, thank you, thank you. Okay, I have a tough question. And Dr. Karen, I'm gonna start with you. So um, it's in the chat. So I'm just gonna relay the question from the audience, but it is a big picture question that I know we're all contemplating because as Sean knows, it's my favorite catchphrase. We've got COVID climate, we've got this need to really, really successfully deliver on nutrition, but then we've got this constriction on cash and capital flow. So who and how do we approach nutrition financing, particularly in a space where it's risky and it's, and it's one of those where you really have to have not only um, international donor support, but frankly, the private sector coming in to help with scale. So what are some of the things that you all have thought about in Nepal and what are some suggestions, recommendations across the panel as far as how we're approaching, approaching nutrition financing? I think it's, it's towards me, right? Okay. Um, you first. Thank you very much for, <laughs> for you know, asking this question um, to me. Um, actually, uh, this is the area where I, I wanted to emphasize and uh, in, in most of the international, you know, symposium like this, I, I highlight this. Um, if I take the example of multi-sector nutrition plan and the situation after COVID has further worsened in our context, actually um, the amount is not that much, around, uh, you know, 48 billion Nepali rupees is projected for five years. But, it, but at the moment, even in normal situation, we do have resource crunching at the moment because Government has limited, you know, capacity to mobilize resources domestically. So obviously, around 40% has been projected uh, to get resources from the international, you know, multi multilateral and uh, bilateral, you know, friends. Uh, but because of the COVID, the situation has further been worsened. So in this context, um, so we are we are really having a tough time, and uh, we are having a dialogue this week with the European Union and other probable, you know, uh, helping hands uh, in this regard. And uh, 
Um, you know, uh, so to my understanding, uh, largely the government should you know expand its resource base to finance nutrition in the long run because uh, all the time you cannot ask uh, money from outside. So domestically, we need to be dependent on ourselves. For that to happen, macroeconomic stability and expansion of you know economic uh, generating activities is very much required. But there are some constraints, you know structural rigidities as there. So until and unless we are ready for that, um, uh, so we need uh, international support. And uh, I have been raising this issue in platform like, you know, uh, scaling up nutrition movement and also in, in international international forum. Um, and um, regarding the COVID, you know, we are, we are having a little bit difficult time now. And um, especially some of the provinces of Nepal are really um, you know, fear to be plunged down in terms of the malnutrition. We are expecting that uh, almost uh, 83,000, you know, children uh, will be suffering from wasting and stunting is going to be, you know, further worsens. So this is a scenario and this is a wonderful opportunity to project that Nepal needs further support, uh, especially uh, to carry um, um, uh, malnutrition against interventions. And uh, we are, you know, reviewing, um, the midterm review is going on of multi-sector nutrition plan second, and we are uh, drafting multi-sector plan third. So, but, but at the end, it's, it's government of Nepal uh, that has to mobilize the resources because we have to understand and the policymaker needs to understand that nutrition should be the prime agenda and that should be fitting in all the policies interventions. Back to you, Aisa. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for highlighting that. And um, I did want to, Sean, I, I do want to push you a little bit, especially given you've worn so many hats when it comes to the nutrition space. You're one of the people I would go to to ask about nutrition financing and how to get not just donors, but really, frankly, the private sector to get more comfortable when it comes to investing in nutrition. So did you want to, you know, add to this Specific yeah, point. Aisha, you know I'm a bit obsessed about this, right? <laughs> uh, and I, I want to put it into context of what other situation you have, uh, you know, a condition that is the attributable cause of 45% of under five deaths. And for those children who survive malnutrition, we know we're setting them up for compromised lives. And if you look and I find, you know, that we are actually very cautious as a nutrition community in our ask. And I would actually posit that compared to the burden that nutrition causes, it's probably one of the most under-resourced sectors in all of development. Then you hear, well, but it's complex. You don't know what to do. Well, in fact, we do know what to do. Now, it's different somewhat than maybe a vaccine, but, but you know, we don't have silver bullets, but we do have actually an arsenal full of very good tools when applied in the right context to work and make quite... And, we're getting increasingly good about knowing what it costs to do that. Um, or then it comes back, oh, but this is competing with other things. It's like, well, no, I don't think it's competing. It's absolutely foundational. If you care about child survival, nutrition has to be central. If you care about education, you're gonna, you know, all those education investments are gonna do much better if you are investing in that first thousand days. Well, uh, if you care about economic growth, we know that there's this whole really vicious cycle of poverty. So. It shouldn't be seen as competition, but absolutely foundational and contributing to everything else we care about. Now, it resonates with me hugely, and Dr. Khan, when you talk about it, is that, you know, obviously from a donor, but not just a donor, at the end of the day, it has to be domestic resources. And I think it's, and it's a, it's, it's a win-win because when other partners, be it private sector, donors, foundations, See, look, the government is not just putting out policies, but is actually voting with its checkbook. That inspires confidence, and it creates this whole virtuous cycle of more investment. I do think a couple of things here in the short term, Aisha, of recognizing that fiscal space is constrained now, both with our partner governments and donor governments, the role of concessional financing, particularly for the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, Africa Development Bank is gonna be huge. And of course, that, those are finances that really are under the control of our partner governments. Secondly, as you know, this is a huge year, the Food Systems Summit in six days time and the Nutrition for Growth, that 
Nutrition for Growth started out in 2013, and I think it was like the first time the nutrition community got serious about how do we galvanize financial resources. And so in a way, it's coming in an awkward time. In a way, it's coming in a good time because it's because of the current situation of the COVID crisis. And as Dr. Kagan has said, the increase is p- potential undermine of nutrition gains. It's a huge opportunity for our partner governments, our partner donors, philanthropies, private sector, and development banks to come to the table and say, yes, we will recommit and up the game in terms of our investments and policy commitments to nutrition. Thank you, Sean. Great, great, great. So I, I think you kind of lent yourself or you, uh, you helped me with my transition because what we all know, raise your hand, it's a make or break year for nutrition. Everybody knows this, right? So. I want the whole panel to kind of just give me what that means to you. What does a make or break year for nutrition mean to you? And this is also your opportunity to kind of give us your final closing thoughts um, as a panel. So feel free to, you know, take just three to five minutes to talk about what does this make or break year mean to you, as well as any closing or parting thoughts that you'd have, and frankly, guidance or advice you'd have for the folks who are listening. Let's start with um, let's start with Sean, and then go to Dr. Webb, Dr. Kieran, Dr. Ghosh, and then end with my closer, Rob. So uh, since you're going to end with Rob, I'm going to start with Rob and the history he lays out. You know, having worked in nutrition for more years than I probably should admit to, I think we started to see a revolution in 2008 with a combination of the food price crisis, the Lancet series, et cetera, where there was like, wow, this is a problem that's under-resourced. And since 2008, while there've been bumps in the road, there has been pretty significant progress. We're now being hit with the rapid onset crisis of COVID, which is undermining those gains. And we know the climate crisis has been brewing for a long time. It will brew for long and it's gonna hit us further and will undermine gains. And on top of it, there's increasing conflict. So to, to me, it's, are we gonna continue this positive trajectory and accelerate having World Health Assembly targets we've all embraced, SDG2, which embraces by 2030, ending all forms of malnutrition. To me, it's make or break because we can either continue that trajectory or we will go into this period of uh, senescence and we will have failed our promises to the people who are most vulnerable to the horrific impacts of malnutrition. Over to you, Aisha. Aisha, you're muted. Dr. Webb? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would, I hope for its make and I, and I'm hopeful it would not be break, even if we did. I think we have to, as somebody said earlier, things take time uh, and they are growing. We have to keep things on the right track. Uh, I think for me, the, the, the potential of this, of this year is to place nutrition or get greater understanding of nutrition as almost a linchpin, a core element, not just to underpinning all the SDGs, but to get nutrition right, malnutrition in all its forms, which includes preventing obesity and, uh, and NCDs, as well as the various undernutrition elements. But to get nutrition right requires us to be almost the glue that helps everyone understand that climate change, zoonotic disease transmission, economic and financial crises, health crises, of the human population are actually all linked. And they're all linked ultimately by the fundamental fact that human beings should eat every day, do, that's the goal. And that the food they eat, the diet that they eat needs to be healthy, nutritious and sustainable. Now, if we can get that message through, through the many events that are happening in this year, then we place nutrition at the core of the human agenda. And a, but it's a human agenda that is a planetary challenge 
and planetary in, in terms of the potential benefits of getting it right. And I think we've just got to aim big. We've got to be ambitious and we've got to make that narrative and get it to stick. Thanks. Yes, um, I think I'd, I'd like to say that um, I want us to think beyond this year. Every year should be the year of nutrition, according to me. I feel the global community needs to stay galvanized. Uh, I think the momentum that was gained from 2008 onwards, but also with the N4G in 2013, um, I, I'm, it is, I think there is a lot of goodwill, a lot of leadership, and there are a lot of champions for nutrition globally, and I would like to see that continue. Um, and I would also reiterate uh, Patrick's point about addressing malnutrition in, in all its forms. Um, we are seeing a very, very um, shifting dynamics around malnutrition. Um, and, and I think that that's very critical to stay highlight, that we need to keep that highlighted. Um, so that's essentially, I, I feel like we, I'm a nutritionist, I'm trained as a nutrition scientist. I've worked in nutrition for 20 years. I'd like to see nutrition stay on the agenda. Over to you, Aisha. Dr. Karen. Excellent point, Dr. Gosh. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, it is critical to strengthen the system, system of health, food and social protection to accelerate it, uh, reduction of undernutrition with the engagement of multi-sector to meet SDGs and tackle nutrition issues in Nepal. To achieve sustainable development goal 2030, we must focus on reaching the unreached improve quality of health and agriculture services, sustainable capacity development, extending the scope of nutrition sensitive agriculture and food environment. So we need to better understand and the potential causes of social inequalities in nutrition, the impact of widespread out migration, especially in country of Nepal, on nutritional status and biological mechanisms that affect nutritional status, multi-sector nutrition governance to name a few. Um, finally, um, so I would also uh, like to see that we need to have a collective action, a vision, and that by 2030, a world will be free from malnutrition in all its form. Uh, that needs to be localized in, in each country, especially country like Nepal. And I would like to appreciate the continuous support of US government in Nepal to improve health and nutrition status in Nepal. Government of Nepal uh, looks forward to have this kind of collaboration with Nutrition Innovation Lab even in future. So thank you. All right, Rob. Thank you, Aisha. And Dr. Kiran, on Good behalf Bertram. of USAID, I wanna thank you our, and all our Nepali colleagues for the partnership we've had. We have learned so much and we have taken those learnings elsewhere. Uh, the rigor and the influence of our partnerships in Nepal is, has provided game-changing insights. So thanks very much to you. Um, Aisha, some years ago now, I concluded that nutrition is the human face of what we do in agriculture and food security. And I think it's why we get our funding. And I think it's why people like Senator Murphy and Congressman McGovern are passionate about what we're doing in Feed the Future and with all our partners across the world. Now we're in the midst, as you know, of developing a new refresh strategy for our work under the Global Food Security Act. We, have see, we are seeing a doubling down on the elevation of gender, which is great news for economic growth and poverty reduction and great news for nutrition. We're seeing an elevation of dietary quality and diversity. Same thing there. I mean, it's a, this is great news for us, and I and, and we have to you know, step up and match the moment. Then we have the Food System Summit coming back to this year. Well, let's be frank. A lot of the drivers of the Food System Summit were not under nutrition, overconsumption, chronic diseases, climate change, both huge challenges and problems that deserve attention and we, for which we must generate solutions. But I think the challenge to us, and I'm so grateful for the rigor of, of the Innovation Lab, the Nutrition Innovation Lab, to give us, to, to keep that focus on undernutrition, the way Shivani talked about, 
And, and in doing so, we can, without losing our focus, we can still do great things for people who are suffering from double and triple burdens of malnutrition associated with poor quality diets and such. So, so, uh, so finally, I think keeping that in focus as we go forward into this food systems vision of the world, we have the nutrition for growth being the, 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 the top point of this year, the culmination, that'll be our chance to refocus again. And then I'd say, let's keep in mind that we have global challenges, but local contexts and different solutions are, are, are needed in different places. And I, I'm so grateful that we have our university partnerships, our partners like if Free, to help us keep our eyes on the prize. And thanks to you, Aisha, for leading us today. No, thank you guys for allowing me to hang out with the cool kids. Uh, the folks working on nutrition are always uh, my favorite folks to talk to. Um, and again, yes, thank you, Dr. Karen, Dr. Ghosh, Dr. Webb, for all of your efforts in making this innovation lab so successful. And for Sean and Rob, um, I consider you all kind of part of my Feed the Future family. And so thank you for letting me be a part of this conversation. And just congratulations to all of you for all of the success that has come out of this and all the future success to come. Um, with that, I actually am going to close us out a little on time slash early. Um, but that being said, I will give everyone one last parting chance. One last parting chance, but I'm gonna put it to you this way. If you had to give one last kind of tidbit for everyone to leave with, it has to be either a one-liner or a hashtag. So everybody here, give me your one-liner or your hashtag to inspire and to push everyone to go out there and get the work done. So, um, sorry, Rob. Wow. I'm gonna say nutrition for growth, economic growth, child development, and growth to reach full adult potential. Love it, love it. And I love eyes on fries too. Anytime you say that, I'm with you. All right, Dr. Karen, any parting words, parting things that you want to give everyone? Any last? Oh, I think you may be muted, Dr. Karen. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I was not expecting this, otherwise I would have- I know, I'm it. sorry. I put you everybody on the spot. <laughs> Nutrition for life. Nutrition for I life. I love it. Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna end with you, Sean. So Dr. Ghosh. Um, this one's I'm stumped, I have to say, but I would say, <laughs> um, you know, research and data for nutrition. Nice, nice. And invest in women. And invest Thanks in people. Really Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. Right. There's your hashtag right there. And Dr. Webb? And I was going to say invest in women. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> because that really meant that, that would be it. But I'm going to say, because I need to get this word in too, a bespoke mission to support global ambition. Oh, nice. Very nice. All right, Sean, no pressure. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to say political will for nutrition. You know, around the table, we're all technocrats and brilliant. But at the end of the day, letting the devastation of malnutrition continue is a political choice. And the illustration today of having the comments from Senator Markey and Representative McGovern demonstrate the political leadership, the political leadership we see in Nepal. Yes, we technocrats, we do great work. But we're at the political leadership saying this is not acceptable. We will go nowhere. And I will build on, I think, Shabani, I agree, every year needs to be a year of nutrition. And the African Union is actually going to adopt 2022 as the year of nutrition. So that's the sort of continued political will and momentum we need. Well, amazing. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody, for um, joining this session. And with that, I am going to thank you all and close us out. So um, appreciate everyone. Thank you so much.